All right, good morning, everyone. How y'all doing this morning? Good? Yeah, well, a lot has happened this week. And, you know, Friday we had crazy uh, grand night. And I just want to give a special shout out to Julia and Eugenia for uh, heading those up. I mean, if you were here, that, the, the place was transformed so beautifully that I, I, I seriously considered just leaving it for Sunday service, you know. But we couldn't do it. Okay. Anyways, and then uh, yesterday, um, all the coworkers came, and we had a, a good training here for, for an all-church training. So we've, we've had a very busy week uh, in terms of ministry, and so it's good to come here on a Sunday morning and just uh, uh, receive from the Word of God. Um, yesterday in the training, it, it was uh, Professor um, Daisy Tai from, from Logos. Um, and she said one thing that stuck to me, and she's like, you know, why do people come to church? Why are people excited about church? Because, she said it in Chinese, but I'll, I'll translate it. Like, because she said, here, and only here, is the Word of God, and here is the love of God. Here you can hear the Word of God, and here you can experience the love of God. And just for those two things alone, people should be running to church, you know, and not be late. That, that, that was her point, you know, like, and, and, and so I'm like, yeah, that, that is true, that is true. Okay, well, we're going to continue our study in the book of Isaiah, and remember last week, Elder Andy came and he preached on Isaiah chapter 24, and he called it the end game, right? I still haven't seen it yet, so please do not spoil it for me. So we're talking about this theme of the end times, because Isaiah prophesies about the end time. And he, uh, Elder Andy talked about that, that in the end, a lot of people will be destroyed because they lived in wickedness and darkness, but there will also be rejoicing because there's going to be a remnant, a, a group of people that will rejoice and sing because they have trusted in God and they have salvation. And so we continue on that theme of chapter 24 of the end times, and then uh, we're skipping chapter 25, which talks about happy songs, you know, like of people rejoicing because of their salvation. And so we come to chapter 26 today, and I have titled it, A Tale of Two Cities, A Tale of Two Cities. How many of you have read that book in school? Do you guys like it? No? Oh. Well, it's a very old book about the French Revolution. But anyways, uh, you know, we're going to talk about our own Isaiah Revolution here, okay? So speaking of cities, cities fascinate me. Cities are a, a great concept, you know. The thing, the thing is, we here who live in Irvine, we have no idea uh, how lucky we are to live in our city, okay? Here's a picture of city of Irvine. Right? We got beautiful homes, we got 85 degrees, you know, we got UCI, one of the top schools, and we got, you know, tech companies like, what do you think this is? Blizzard, yeah. We got companies like Blizzard and Google that, that are here. I mean, it's just a great city. People from all around the world want to move to America. Is that true? Yeah? Yeah, it is true. That's why you're here. <laughs> And they want to achieve the American dream because America is the most prosperous nation in the world and the number one superpower in the world. And of those people who immigrate to America, they, a lot of them want to move to California. Why? Because of the beautiful weather here. You know, it's not freezing here like the East Coast, and it's not humid like the South. You know, over here we get a nice Southern California weather where people can go surf and go to the beach. And, and of the people that come to California, a lot of them want to come to Orange County because of its, what? Of its wealth, of its affluence. Did you know that Orange County has, I think, roughly, what, 20-something 20, 20 cities in this county? And Orange County alone has, the, has five of the wealthiest cities in America. Can you believe that? And many people in Orange County, they want to come and move to Irvine because of the high level of 
the educational system here. You know, one of the best, high, you know, several of the best high schools in the state. And we have the safest neighborhood in, in the country for populations of over 200,000. So there's a lot of cities under 200,000 people. They're kind of like rural cities, so nothing much happens there. But for a city that's over 200,000, Irvine is the number one safest city in America. And people want to move here because of the job opportunities in the high-tech industries, like we said here. Okay? And so that's why half of us in this room who are parents, we immigrated here, right? You guys immigrated here. And you are living the American dream because you live right here in Orange County and Irvine in South County. So, yeah, man, you have done very well. Congratulations just by being here, okay? And the other half of us were born here, right? And we grew up here, and we have no idea how good we've got it, okay? Because you're just so used to it. You're like, oh, this is just life, you know? It's ordinary life. But if you travel around the world enough, you'll find out that when you come back to Irvine, it is like heaven on earth. Okay, you don't know because you've never lived for a long time anywhere else. And so, you guys know where this place is, right? Yeah, Disneyland. No, nuts. <laughs> Irvine Spectrum. <laughs> it's co no, not Costco. Yeah, Irvine Spectrum. So, when I was young, when I was a teenager, I mean, I, I lived in Orange. In Orange, there's not much happening in Orange. Like, nobody goes to Orange for anything, right? Like, do you, do you guys, li, you who live in Irvine or wherever, do you guys ever visit Orange? No, there's like nothing there, right? So when I lived in Orange, I would visit Irvine Spectrum, and it was such a special treat. Well, back then it was, because it, when I got there, it looked like paradise. I'm like, wow, all these palm trees. I mean, this place looks like paradise. You know, nowadays, I live near Spectrum, okay, and I take my kids there every single week. Like, every week, we go to Barnes & Noble's, we shop at Target, whether it's get milk or bread or whatever, and we eat somi somi, you know, yay, you know, somi somi, you guys love it. And it's a normal routine for my kids, and, then, and, and they think this is the normal life for everyone around the world. Everybody gets to eat somi somi, and everybody shops at Target and, and go to Barnes & Noble. No, this is not normal. Let me tell you guys, this is not normal. They don't know that they live in paradise, okay? When we go on the merry-go-rounds, you know, hey, they just want to hop on. You know, half the kids in the world, you know what the, their toy is? It, it's a little jug, okay? And, and they, they take, take the cap off, and they make wheels out of it, okay? Half the world lives in poverty. Half the world have toys like this. Okay, and I'm not even joking. And even with churches, with our spiritual lives, we have churches like this. W which church is this? Do you guys know? Mariner. Yeah, Mariner's Church, right, in Irvine, right by UCI. And, and this is the building where everybody goes to get married, right? Just this past year, I think I went there twice to see my friends get married there. And when I get on campus, I mean, it's surrounded by water, and, and, and trees and fountains. and my, I mean, it, it feels like the Garden of Eden. I'm like, it, this, is what, this is what Garden of Eden must feel like. It feels like Mariner's Church, you know? Um, yeah, paradise on earth. And we just don't know how good we have it in this city until we visit other cities in the world. And so let's contrast that with other cities around the world, okay? And can you guess where th this city is? Where is this? Did, did someone say Taiwan? No, this is not Taiwan. Okay. Some of the most dangerous cities in the world. Can you guess? Ravaged by war, ravaged by ISIS. This is Syria. Damascus. Okay. Damascus, Syria. Ravaged by ISIS. Okay. And in 2014, it was ranked the least livable city in the world. Like, no, nobody can live there. Nobody can thrive there. Actually, you can't even stay alive there. There's no food. There's no water. There's nothing because of war and violence. Okay, can you guess where this is? I'll give you a hint. It's in California. Compton? No. Oakland. Exactly. Oakland. 
Orange. No, it's not orange. I don't even think we have police officers in orange. Okay. No, it's, it's Oakland. Actually ranked the second most dangerous city in America in 2014. Okay, because of the gang violence that is there. And uh, last year when I went to uh, City Impact, I landed in Oakland and I had to take the BART to, to City Impact. You know, as I look out the window, I'm like, oh, I've never been to Oakland. You know, this is the home of the Oakland A's. Yeah, you know, in the 80s, Jose Canseco, yay, woo, you know. <laughs> Nobody knows who that is, you know. Um, <laughs> yeah, I feel old enough. And I was like, Oakland should be awesome. And I look out the window, and I'm thinking, what kind of city is this? Get me out of here fast. You know, I feel kind of, I feel unsafe, even being in the bar, just looking out the window in Oakland, okay? And then, can you guess this city? City. Tijuana. Tijuana. Of course, you know, I gave you a hint, you know, it's the, it's the U.S. border here, so it must be Tijuana. You guys have been through this route multiple times. You know, those of you who went to Mexico Mission last week, which is like 20 of you, you guys, you guys were here, like right here, exactly, okay? Well, just this year, did you know that Tijuana is ranked the most dangerous city in the world? In 2018, Tijuana saw 138 homicides per 100,000 people. For every 100,000 people. And Irvine is roughly a quarter of a million people. That means in that rate, we would see about 300 murders in the city alone in one year. Last year in Irvine, did you hear of any murders? I, I didn't. But if, if there was, it might be in single digits. But in in Tijuana, 138 homicides per 100,000. How many million people are in Tijuana? So there's thousands and thousands of homicides, murders, killings in Tijuana alone, okay? The Mexico team, uh, you guys pass by Tijuana multiple times a year, okay? And it is by God's grace that we are all safe when we travel there, okay? I have a friend, he's very bold, uh, uh, I think born in Honduras. I thought he was Mexican, but he said, I'm not Mexican, I'm Honduran. Okay, anyways, lives in Riverside. He's a bold evangelist. He was a former cop. He goes door to door, knock on the doors to share the gospel. I mean, bold as can be, you know? I'm like, this guy's like 10 times bolder than I am. I, I wouldn't do half the st stuff he does, you know? And I told him, um, yeah, our church goes down to Mexico several times a year, and I invited him to come down with us because, you know, he speaks Spanish and all. And I'm like, yeah, you... You, you would do a great job in Mexico, you know? You, you're, you're so bold here. He's a pastor. And he shaked his head. He said, no way. I'm not going down to Mexico. I'm, he's all, it's too dangerous down there. I'm like, what do you mean? You're like almost Mexican. What are you talking about, you know? And I'm thinking, it's, it's not that bad. And he looks at me, and he's like, man, he didn't say it, but from his eyes, he's like, man, you're such an ignorant tourist. You don't know. You have no idea how dangerous it is over there, Okay. Anyways, the point is, I just want to illustrate how different cities can be. We live in one of the safest cities in the world, and just going down two hours, there can be the most dangerous city in the world, okay? Irvine and Tijuana can be as different as it is, you know? It's this tale of two cities that I believe Isaiah is trying to paint a portrait of, okay? How many of you have cash in your pocket right now? Yeah? Yeah? No? You're broke? Yeah, okay. You know, look, you know, Austin, look in your bill. Can you find a phrase right here called, in God we trust, on your dollar bill? <laughs> yeah, it's right there, right? Yeah. And, and every dollar bill, or $5 bill, $10, $20, $100 bill, there's a phrase called, in God we trust. Okay? I, and I bet you knew that already. But did you know when this motto was adopted? It was actually adopted during the, the Civil War in the 1800s by the U.S. Congress. So it passed the Congress to put, in God we trust, on money, on our currency. Why? Because the, during that time, it was a time of turmoil in our country, right? And, and, and so it's human nature that we turn to God when we are in a desperate situation, when we are in turmoil, in the Civil War that killed I think, how many millions of people? 
600,000 people, 600,000 people in that war brought the nation to seek after God. In recent years, uh, the various groups have been uh, trying to challenge this motto. They're like, hey, take God out of, out of our currency, okay? Because this motto is a violation of uh, separation of church and state. And so in the past, you know, in the 60s, the public school system took public prayer out of school. Did you know that public prayer was a part of school prior to the 60s? Well, 60s, 70s, they took it out of school. And now they're trying to take, in God we trust, out of our currency. They're trying to take the Ten Commandments out of um, the courtrooms. But in, in this effort, they have not, not succeeded yet. Okay? And the basic reason why people want to change this, this national motto is this. Is, is because our current motto, this in God we trust, has never represented all citizens of the United States. It has never represented the view, the worldview, and the ideal of everyone in America. Maybe a group of Americans, a group of people say, in God we trust, but another big group is like, no, in God we don't trust. Okay, and that is a true statement. To say that everyone in America trusts in God or the U.S. government fully trusts in God, that is not a reality. But it's okay. God is not concerned about whether we have this thing stamped in our currency, that we, whether we say that we trust in God or not. What he cares about is whether we actually trust in him or not by our actions. Okay, and we keep returning to this issue of trust, of a nation, of a city, of a nation, of people trusting in God. Because the whole first half of Isaiah has the, the, this basic underlining theme of trust. Do you trust in God or not? The Israelites, in the first half of Isaiah, they claimed to trust in God. And to a certain degree, they did. A, a certain group of people, they did. But they also trusted in Baal. They also trusted in Molech. They also trusted in uh, Ashtoreth and other gods. Uh, and they, they trusted God, but then they also put their trust in other nations, such as Assyria and Babylon and Egypt and other nations, trying to find alliance, to, to form alliances for their own protection. Remember back in chapter 7 when we talked about King Ahaz, he turned away from God and looked to the Assyrians because of their mighty army because of their strong horses, because of their uh, vast number of warriors. So Ahaz trusted in only what he could see. He wanted the power of the armies like Assyria. They trusted God, but they also trusted in their own schemes to get ahead financially. They, they did anything to get ahead financially by forcing the poor into deeper poverty or even slavery. They took advantage of them. They, they, they formed monopolies to take advantage of the lower class. And so while the, the names and the context is different, we see that the issues are the same for the United States today as they were for the nation of Judah in the 8th century B.C. is this concept of trust. And so here in Isaiah Chapter 26, Isaiah gives us four contrasts between those who trust in God and those who don't. Okay, I put the, the imagery here to, to make a contrast. The, the city of Zion, the city of Jerusalem, the, the city of God versus a city of ruins. Okay, and he gives us four contrasts. First, if a city, if a people trust in God, the city will be a city of salvation. Those who do not trust in God, the city will be a city of ruins. Second, if we trust in God, he will give us a straight path. But if we do not, we will have an aimless path. We will walk in ways and we'll be lost. We won't know where we're going. Third, Isaiah says that if we trust God, we will have divine abilities. We can walk in God's power and his might. But if we don't trust God, we walk in our human inabilities. We think we can do a lot of things, but we actually cannot. And fourth, if we trust in God, we'll have e eternal life in the, in the future, in the days to come. But if not, we will end up in judgment. Okay? And so we're going to go over four, these four contrasts uh, in detail. 
And so if you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 26, and we're going to read verses uh, 1 to 4. And it starts off like this. It says, In that day, everyone in the land of Judah will sing the song. Well, in that day, in which day? In, in the end times, in the last days, in the future, in the days to come. And he says, we're going to sing. We're, we're, we're rejoicing because something good is happening. And he says, our city is strong. We are surrounded by the walls of God's salvation. Open the gates to all who are righteous. Allow the faithful to enter. You will keep in perfect peace all who trust in you, all whose thoughts are fixed on you. Trust in the Lord always, for the Lord God is the eternal rock. Wow. Wow. Okay. So Isaiah is saying, man, we we can sing. In those days, people are going to sing because they're going to take pride in their city. We are a strong city. And we we can relate here. Those of us who who live in Orange County and South County, we're like, yeah, we live in a strong city. We can take pride in that, you know. And and the writers of Hebrew call us to look for a city whose architect and builder is God. Don't we want to live in a city whose architect and builder is God? It's going to be way better than Irvine. Even though Irvine is awesome compared to the rest of the world, the city of salvation is going to be a million times more glorious. Okay? And the apostle John described this holy city, this new Jerusalem, in Revelation chapter 21 in great detail, and it is the most glorious city that we have ever seen. And I remember it was a couple years ago that Peter preached on heaven, preached on this glorious city. And it is this like giant golden city of like cube, thousands of miles wide, just coming down from heaven, landing on earth. If you want more details, read Revelation 21. And so what does Isaiah say about that city? First, he tells us it's strong and that its walls are, are walls of salvation. If you're within the walls, man, God's salvation is here upon you. If you're outside of those walls, sorry, salvation is not with you. There is no protection for you. So there's a clear distinction here. Those who are saved inside the city and those who are not. Those who are protected by God and those who are not. Okay. And and it says, you will be kept in perfect, you will keep in perfect peace. You who? You God. God will give you perfect peace for all who trust in him. Do you have perfect peace this morning? Do you have perfect peace? That depends if you trust in him, and it depends on if your thoughts are fixed upon God. You know, we we may be Christians, we may believe in God, but a lot of times we're so distracted by the things of this world that our thoughts are on the circumstances, are on the troubles, and our thoughts are not fixed on God. And so when trouble comes, we get so anxious, we get so depressed. We get so fixated on the problems of this world because we have drifted our eyes from God to these things. And Isaiah is exhorting to us, trust in the Lord always, for God is the eternal rock. Don't look upon your circumstances. Look upon the eternal rock. And so he contrasts this with the city of man, the city of ruins. In verse 5, he says, God, he humbles the proud and brings down the arrogant city. He brings it down to the dust. The poor and oppressed trample it underfoot, and the needy walk over it. And this really echoes the New Testament in James 4, 6. It says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Meaning that if you're a prideful man and you exalt yourself, and you're always saying, hey, look at me, I'm the best, I'm number one. And you're proud, the Bible says God's going to humble you. God's going to push you down. But if you humble yourself, you walk lowly, you know your limitations as a human being, you walk humbly, the Bible says God's going to lift you up. And in this city, this city is called the city of man, the city of arrogance. It's an arrogant city. It's a lofty city. Okay, Man take pride in building giant big cities. And they get prideful. Now, we don't need God. We can do all this by ourselves. Then God's going to humble the city. 
humble it, level it. Okay. Who wants to live in a city like this in the end times? No one. So let's humble ourselves willingly before God humbles us unwillingly. Okay. So how does one get inside the city? You know, in verse 2, it says, you've got to enter the gates. Enter the gates. There is a gate. You know, this is the city of Jerusalem, and I think this is called the Damascus Gate as people walk in. Um, and so how? How do we enter the gate? We know that we're not actually going to buy a ticket and fly to Jerusalem and enter that gate, right? But this is talking about Jesus. Jesus Christ, he said he is the gate. He's, in, in John 10.10, 10, he says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and out and find pasture. The thief comes to only kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Jesus said, I am the gate. I am the door, the door to the city of salvation. We can't enter the city by climbing over the wall. We can't do that. We can't try to save ourselves by our own effort, our own good works, our own merits, our own righteousness. It doesn't work like that. We, we can't dig under the wall. We, we can't try to go around God's righteousness, go around God's salvation, because there's only one way. God, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to the Father but through me. You have to go straight down the gate doors. Okay? He is the one that provides. It is through Jesus Christ alone. And we can never enter into it by our own righteous works, but by our faith in God. Okay. And you see this picture here. It's a, it's a painting of two cities. The city is high and lofty. See a lot of skyscrapers? Man, when, when the people built this, they must have been proud. Okay. And then there's the city of God. But this city is in destruction. But the only way to the city of God, the city of salvation, is through the cross of Jesus Christ. And in the city of God, the people there are righteous because, why? Because they fix their eyes upon him. They are righteous because their trust is in the Lord forever. And we are declared righteous because we trust in God, not because we carry around a currency that says, in God we trust. Okay? Even atheists carry around the, the currencies that says, in God we trust. And so Isaiah contrasts the city of God with the city of man. And trusting in God allows us to dwell in that city. Okay? The city of man may look secure, may look well-established, may look amazing, but looks are deceiving because in the end, Isaiah says, the cities will be demolished. So we've got to choose which city do we want to live in. Okay? And then secondly, Isaiah talks about the straight path. If we trust in God, God is going to provide for us a straight path. But if not, it is an aimless path. Do you like to work hard aimlessly? No, you wouldn't. You, when you study for a test, you, you want to ace that test. You know exactly where you're going. Would you study really hard if there was no test? Come on, be honest. No way. If there's no test, why would you study? But he's painting a picture of this. We're studying really hard. We're working really hard, but we have... Nothing to, to work for. There's nothing that will result in that. Verse 7, but for those who are righteous, the way is not steep and rough. You are a God who does what is right. You know, Isaiah is exalting God here. And you smooth out the path ahead of them. Lord, we show our trust in you by obeying your laws. Our heart's desire is to glorify your name. In the night I search for you. In the morning I earnestly seek you. For only when you come to judge the earth will people learn what is right. So this is a prayer that Isaiah is exalting God. Lord, because we trust in you, you are making a path for us. You're smoothing out the rough edges, all these rocks and rough roads. You're smoothing it out for us, God. And because you're paving a way for us to seek you, in the night I search for you. And when I wake up in the morning, I seek you, God, because you have made this road for me. This divine path, God's path, is level and straight. It's smooth and clear. And the idea here is that God's path is straight because God himself is straight. God's path is righteous because God is righteous. 
We walk in God's path by imitating the characters of God. If God is love and we walk in love, then we walk in the ways of God. Does that make sense? If God is grace, if God is mercy and we walk in grace of mercy, then we walk in the ways of God. You know, Isaiah is not saying that the, 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 the path of God is this walk in the park. But he's saying that this path is easy to find. Well, just because a path is easy to find doesn't mean that it's easy, okay? Because the Bible talks about the narrow path. Righteous is the narrow path, but wide is the road to destruction. The path is easy to find, but not many people will walk in it because it is a narrow path, okay? And so... God displays his character in, several, in a lot of ways to us. You know, the way is easy to find. First, God reveals himself through the Bible. How many of you have a Bible on you right now? It can be digital. Well, then everybody should raise their hand, right? I mean, the ways of God is right in your pocket. Is it hard to find? No, it's easy. Second, he reveals himself through the incarnation of Jesus Christ. Third, he reveals himself through other Christians around us. And so all that God is asking us to do is to just imitate his character, to grow more like Jesus every day. Okay, it, I know imitating Christ may not be easy, but the requirements are very clear. You have it right there in your pocket. Okay. And by contrast, what is this aimless path? Isaiah is saying, your kindness, God, your kindness to the wicked doesn't even make them do good. You're, you're, you're good to them, you're kind, you're gracious to them but they don't care, they don't do good. Although others do right, the wicked keep doing wrong and take no notice of the Lord's majesty. O oh Lord, they pay no attention to your upraised fist. Show them your eagerness to defend your people, then they will be ashamed. Let your fire consume your enemies. He's saying, God, and Isaiah is talking about this from his perspective, right? You're so good to them. And yet they forsake you, yet they have turned your back on you. And they don't even know that you're, you have your fist up. You're, you know, they're bringing judgment upon themselves, and, and the fist of God is upraised, about to strike, and they don't even know that. And therefore, let your fire consume your enemies. And then Isaiah gives us this third contrast of the city of God and the city of man, and that is his divine ability versus human inability. And in this, Isaiah says, Lord, you will grant us peace. All we have, have accomplished is really from you. O Lord, our God, others have ruled us, but you alone are the one we worship. Those we served before are dead and gone. Their departed spirits will never return. You attack them and destroy them, and they are long forgotten. O oh Lord, you have made our nation great. Yes, you have made us great. You have extended our borders, and we give you the glory. Remember, during this time, I, I, Isaiah, he's um, giving counsel to kings, many generations of kings, in his 60 years of service in the nation of Judah. And that nation is always fighting battles with their with their neighbors, with the Assyrians, with the Babylonians, with, with whoever it is, right? And, and, and he is saying, you are the one that delivers us. You are the one that attacks our enemies and destroy them, and they are forgotten, and you have made our nation great, and you have extended our borders. You have made our nation even larger, and to you we give you all the glory you know, you got to notice, you got to realize that Judah is this tiny little nation of people. Their enemies are so much bigger and stronger. They're outnumbered greatly. And so that's why Isaiah is saying, if you live in the city of God, you will have divine abilities. Although your armies are small compared to other great armies, you will defeat them because God is on your side. He is fighting your battle. Okay? But in contrast... What if you don't trust in God? Lord, in distress, we search for you. We prayed beneath the burden of your discipline. 
just as a pregnant woman writhes and cries out in pain as she gives birth. So will we in your presence, Lord, we too writhe in agony, but nothing comes of our suffering. We have not got given salvation to the earth, nor brought life into the world. And this is kind of like a prayer of a people that didn't put their trust in God, and as a result, they're in distress, and now they're kind of coming back to, to search for God, to, to pray to God once again. And so these are people in distress, and, and, he, and they're saying, Lord, we are distressed. We're searching for you. Where are you, God? Where are you? Just like a, a pregnant woman in pain. Those of you who are moms here, we honor you because you have gone through pain that is unimaginable for us men, okay? Any, any woman that has, has had a child knows that giving birth is unimaginable effort, unimaginable pain. Oh, for those of you uh, teenage girls, don't, don't worry, okay? I'm not trying to scare you of, of having children, okay? Your, your mom made it through, so hey, you're going you're gonna to be all right. Okay, so for nine months, this, you, you carry this child within you, and it's growing inside of your womb. And, and when the day arrives, there's agony, right? When labor comes, you're screaming, ah, the baby is coming. Take me to the hospital. And all the husbands are like scrambling. Oh, okay, all right, what, what do I need to get? I need to get my diaper bag. Oh, man. I'm a... You know, the, the men, they're in agony too, you know, because we don't know what to do, okay? There's great distress on the woman and on the men, okay? There's screaming, there's tears from the men as well, okay? There's suffering, all right? And Isaiah is painting this picture of a woman struggling to give birth because this is the strongest image of pain that Isaiah can come up with. Woman and childbirth, that's the most painful thing in the whole world, more painful than war probably, right? And, but, but what happens? As she goes into labor, as she screams in agony, as she suffers, nothing comes out. No baby. It was for nothing. That's what Isaiah was trying to get across. When we work in our own strength, we scream, we agonize, and the result is nothing. No babies. And even if we were to work as hard as a woman giving birth, we accomplish nothing. And, and this is the picture Isaiah is trying to paint. Are you working in God's strength? Or are you working with your own strength? Because in the end, no matter how much money is in your bank, no matter how big your house is, in the end, you can't take any of that with you. Where are you going to be? Are we as a church working in God's divine ability or our own human ability? We can think about this in our own individual lives. We can think about this in terms of our family. Okay, For us husbands, men of the house, where are we leading our family? And as a church, for us, for, for me as a pastor, for our leaders in the church, are, are we doing programs that are just making a lot of effort but accomplishing nothing, or are we laboring in God's strength? Are, are we sharing the gospel? Are, are we a place where the gospel can shine and people can have eternal life through the gospel? Okay. And then finally, the final contrast that Isaiah draws is, be, is between this eternal destination of the righteous and the wicked. Verse 19, but those who die in the Lord will live, meaning those who die trusting in the Lord will live in the Spirit. Their bodies will rise again. Those who sleep in the earth will rise up and sing for joy, for your light-giving light will fall like dew on your people in the place of the dead. This, there's a part of this afterlife that I don't fully understand. Because I know, like, if, if I were to die right now, which I hope not, you know, if I were to die right now, I, 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 I know that, you know, my spirit is going to go and be with God. 
Okay, my body will be here, but my, my spirit will be with God, and I'll be in heaven. But there's this part of this mystery that in the end times, that we're not just going to have spiritual bodies, this invisible spiritual body. That in the, in, in the end times, and somehow heaven is going to come down on earth, like that picture of that the, the new city of Jerusalem described in Revelation 21. Like, like somehow, I don't know how, it boggles my mind that this spiritual city of heaven is going to come down visibly upon earth. And somehow our spiritual bodies would have this resurrected body that will be on earth once again, that we won't stay in heaven forever, like up there, that heaven's going to come down on earth. And so that's why we pray in our Lord's Prayer, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, thy kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. So there's this mystery of heaven and the age to come. That we're not going to be staying up there forever and we're going to come down. Okay, so that's why it says those who die in the Lord will live. Their bodies will rise again. How does that happen? I don't know. Are people going to be coming out of graves? I, I'm not sure. That sounds kind of scary, right? But somehow God's going to make it happen. God is the one that brings something out of nothing. Right? God will take dirt up from the ground, breathe into it, and make human beings out of it, made Adam and Eve out of it. So God can do it. I don't know how, but, but it's a glorious thing, okay? But for those who do not trust in God, Isaiah says, go home. If you don't trust in God, go home. Go home, my people, and lock your doors. Hide yourself for a little while until the Lord's anger has passed. Look, the Lord is coming from heaven to punish the people of the earth for their sins. The earth will no longer hide those who have been killed. They will be brought out for all to see. Isaiah is saying, go home. Don't be here. Lock your doors because when that day comes, it is better that you hide from God because we can't not even imagine what the wrath of God, what the judgment of God will look like. Because judgment day is coming for the ones who die in their sins without forgiveness, without grace, without mercy. And so I beg of you, those of us in this room right now, do not be this person. Do not be this person. Okay? We don't want to go home and lock our doors and hide from God. You know, there's this children, old school children's song. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. But the lyrics kind of goes like there's, it says, there's one door, okay, there's one door and only one, yet the sides are two. There's two sides to a door. There's inside and there's outside. Which side are you? And there's one way, there's one path, okay? There's, there's one road, but the ways are two. There's the right way and the wrong way. Which way are you? And we can go on that there is one strength. There's only one strength, yet the works are two. There's his strength or our strength. Which strength are you? There's one eternity and only one, yet the results are two. Eternal life with God or eternal life separated from God. Which one are you? This morning, maybe some of us may feel distant from God. And if that's you, just, just pray this simple prayer with me, okay? If God has been speaking to you through his word, let, let's not waste this time. Let's just bow our head in prayer, okay? If today you feel distant from God or, or you might not know him at all, but you want to, grow closer to him. You want to come back and walk with him. Would you just pray a simple prayer with me in your heart? Just say, God, forgive me of my sins. I need your forgiveness. Be the master of my life. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins and that you rose again on the third day. So I put my faith 
and I put my trust in you. Amen. And if you pray that simple prayer, you will be in the city of salvation in the last days, so you can rejoice, you can sing songs of joy like Isaiah started out this chapter, that in that day, the people of God will be singing. Amen?